to our very fine and elite audience tonight. As we try to come back to poetry readings with people in chairs with faces that we actually see and not on little squares on Zoom uh, sessions. And my name is Charles Alexander. I am both the director of Chax Press and one of the directors of the organization POG, uh, both of which, I'm gonna wax a little unpoetic about being in this space, both of which have long histories in this space. POG from its very origins in 1996 that periodically had readings here uh, in different spaces in this building too. And Chax Press since, um, since this building first kind of got opened to artists in 1986 and it was the studio for almost 20 years. Um, there were artists kind of squatting in this building even before that. But I think uh, I wanted, you know, we talk about sometimes the space and I wanted to give a thanks tonight actually to uh, Tucson artist Barbara Gargudis who first pulled this building kind of out of a possible movement toward falling apart uh, and made it available to artists and invited some of us in here. And this was long before the city of Tucson thought of developing a warehouse arts district. And although it, I think in some ways it led to that. And, uh, and I think there's one person here, I think probably now Elizabeth Krieger who's here is has tenure as the most senior artist in the Steinfeld Warehouse. It's been here the longest. No, Joe's here. Oh, Joe's here. Yeah, Joe no, okay. Here. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in the running, but no. Okay, all right. Um, because this is jointly sponsored by both Chax Press and POG, I'm not gonna do all the typical POG thank, you, thank yous, except to lump it all together and thank all the people who have donated, given grants and sponsored uh, POG events and Chax Press events too. And I also want to say um, that as probably most of you here know, uh, you know, we stand on lands that are the traditional ancestral lands of the um, Tohono O'odham, Native American peoples, and have been since very early in the 20th century is the lands of the Yaqui peoples once they left Mexico in certain ways by force and, and located here. And if you go back a lot longer to the Hohokam uh, 2000 years ago and more, and it's always nice to just take a moment to think about what place means, particularly to peoples who have been deprived of those places or have had to struggle for those places. And uh, so thank you for letting me do that. Okay, I want to first uh, introduce Kelsey Bonata, who um, is program director, is that the right title? Program manager. Program yeah. manager for ALTA, the American Literary Translators Association. And some of you may know her best as that, particularly if you've been attending or, uh, or maybe participating in ALTA's activities, including a wonderful uh, conference annually that brings international people here who translate works. And without translation, uh, this global entity we live on would be a much more difficult place. And I think, uh, you know, all of us have benefited by what Alta has done. But Kelsey is a poet as well, who holds an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop, as well as an MFA in literary translation from the University of Iowa. She writes poems and translates from Spanish and collaboratively from Swedish. So with all the places she has her feet, she's automatically uh, both global and postmodern. <laughs> um, she's worked there at Alta since 2018. She has won several awards, 
uh, including the Jules Chemetsky Translation Prize and also the 2018 American Scandinavian Foundation Nadia Christensen Prize and a Fulbright um, semifinalist and a Alta Travel Fellow and a, and I won't pronounce this right, Kluthaupt Fellowship recipient, 2016 and 17. Um, I think, uh, you know, I was away from Tucson and moved back here in 2018, in which at a time in which it was pretty immediately evident that one of the, uh, I think at that time or soon thereafter, a recent, I don't know, move to Arizona by Alta uh, made that organization established as one of the centers of poetry here. And I think a part of that establishment is Kelsey's great work on behalf of poets and behalf of um, translators and on behalf of all those who benefit from <coughs> such work. Uh, and I'm excited to hear her work as well. So please welcome Kelsey Benoit. Thanks, Charles. Do I need to stand? We don't have this. No. Okay. Good. Do we have that Even turned better. on? I don't think it's on. Do you want it turned on or do you need No, it? I don't think so. Thank you. 20, 20 minutes, you said, yeah? Ish. Yeah, we're not going to put you on the clock. Okay. Well, I might put myself on the clock. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, well, thank you for being here. Uh, this this evening is a really big deal for me. Um, the chapbook that I'm reading from tonight uh, came out in March 2020, so almost, yeah, more than two years ago now. Uh, and it's really the first time that it's, that it's in the world and that I'm getting to read from it. So a huge thank you to, um, to Jax and to Pog um, for that. It's also a great honor to read with Janet Rodney tonight. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I'm just incredibly grateful for uh, people and organizations who support um, emerging writers and translators like myself. So thanks for letting me read to you tonight. Um, I have more often read from my translations. So as I was saying before, I was just also really happy that Charles encouraged me to read some of my own poems to you tonight, and I'll share a few translations um, toward the end as well. Um, so this chapbook, Rare Earth, uh, it, some of these poems feel old to me. I was writing um, many of them at, at Iowa when I was there. Um, some of them are in my thesis. Um, uh, and so they're just, yeah, they're very special poems to me. Um, my family's, uh, my mom's, my family on my mom's side is largely ranchers in South Dakota. My great grandfather uh, immigrated from Denmark to the US. So that's the Nordic connection. Um, but uh, the, the prairie and the ranch in South Dakota has always been a place of, of really great inspiration for me. Um, so it's kind of appropriate that you brought up place and sort of the power of place. Uh, it's a nostalgic kind of place for me. I find it uh, very beautiful. Um, now that it's no longer, the ranch is no longer in the family, I feel especially sort of nostalgic about it. Um, but as I think you'll see in, in some of these poems, uh, the more time I spent writing about it and writing about sort of how these family stories get passed down, um, what also kept coming up was the violence of this place. Um, of course, settler colonial violence, um, but also uh, the harshness of the landscape itself, the harshness of the, of the work that it is, um, you know, uh, gun violence as well. So you'll definitely hear, hear that come up in, in here. Um, okay, I made myself a little, a little list to go through. But I'm going to start with reading you the quotes that I put at the beginning of the book. I don't think we, I don't think we do that enough. I, I picked these, uh, these citations. Um, I picked them myself, and I picked them for a reason, so I wanted to share them with you. The first is Eleni Sicilianos, who's really a mentor 
of mine. She was a teacher of mine at University of Denver. And she has a line, the memory house too airy and blown out to hold more. And then C.D. Wright, whoever rides into the scene changes it. And Carl Phillips, there's a weed whose name I've meant all summer to find out. So this poem's called, oh, come in, come in for poems. This is a ranch called Bruise. I stream back, I cannot help, but pick up a house as I go and other things of that nature. I'm the ghost who haunts it. Every single expression keep hushing. I didn't mean to meet you in my dream. Can't work toward or at you. But finally, a cool wind off the dam. Look what color it is now as tender as ever it was. Whoever lived in the house before you must have been the same. Don't let it tell you anything to ears. And there's some poems in here that don't have titles. They're sort of interspersed between the longer poems. So I'll just add a few of those in. Touch a thing to keep it in its place. The years he spent his arm inside a cow, feeling for a calf. There is a bunch of um, ranch sonnets in here, sort of loose, sort of loose sonnets. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Um, so I'll read, I'll read you a few of those. Um, this one's called Cow Sense. This family just might have more cattle photographs than folks. Whole sleeves of them by year, clear back to caster of Valley Mound, the oldest registered Angus bull anyone ranching who now remembers can remember. Folders full of names like Windy Star, Ingalls Special Five, Big Fortune. And there were the almost pets, the docile bull that followed Dale for scratches behind the ears, the steer Duane dressed up. I had cattle too. The cow with ear tag 342 laid on her calf till it was dead. At auctions later, their issue turned tuition dollars. The calves in headgates I have sprayed with flea dip, watching testicles yanked out and slashed, trailing long red cords. Good eye appeals, what grandpa says, licorices sucked and socketed. If you select for just one trait too hard, you sacrifice another. The breed's in a good place. When I went back to the prairie, I couldn't find the blade of grass, boot jack, swaying shack. Couldn't even find the ball glass, heifer smash. It was a beautiful day to This poem's called, I am bound to tell you. You might hear echoes of, um, it's about fixing fence. So you might hear echoes a little bit of uh, Robert Frost's mending wall in here. I am bound to tell you. We fix the boundaries. It's fallen to us to fix them. All trusses and leftovers and sticks. 
The land is bound to shift, the posts to sink and lean and wires to sag. We drag a wire in the dust behind the truck to draw it from its coil. It tries to bound away, goes straight. At the midpoint of the boundary where your place bounds on mine, we meet and look across the line and both fix right. We stretch the wire tight. We splice the brakes with bits of spare, then bind it to the posts and sense each other through the line. Not mine. We're both bound up in this. We're grabbing at the pieces, pushing from our grasp. We'll insist on we. Imagine we can keep it up. Homebound, some say. I'm bound for I don't know. The sky looks hammered flat out. I saw a dead goose here once under this power line. It was quite. So um, this next one is another, it's another ranch sonnet. Uh, and it deals more specifically with the history of gun violence in my own family. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll hear sort of um, the story told through the poem. It's something I've been tried, trying to write about for a really long time. Um, I tried writing you know, poems when I was in undergrad and I even tried writing it as an essay and I tried writing this story as a, as a short play. Uh, and in the end, sort of all I got was one, one poem out of it, one sonnet. Um, uh, it's sort of everything distilled, I think, into, into this one poem. There are some graphic images, um, just so that you know. I am at a pain to represent the following array. <coughs> After the house burned in 82, I know the dog Blackie whined and pawed the hot ash till they had to put her away. On, a, on the ranch, put down or away was another way to say shot. As a teen, I put away a prairie dog. I'd been convinced they were vermin whose holes could take down a cow worth a few thousand dollars. Maybe that was true. In any case, I held and fired the 22. You could say too, that the boy, Daniel, who was not my cousin, put away my uncle, Duane. You might call him my uncle's foster son. He was 17 when he did it, so you might not call him a boy. In the end, the courts did not. I've tried, but there is no other way to say. One day, he waited at the window of the farmhouse they shared and aimed and put him away. I think of them often. A piece of trash leapt at the side of the road. And this time it didn't turn mud, it turned gold. So this is the last um, ranch sonnet that I'll read to you. It's about how my siblings and I, um, we didn't grow up on the ranch. We spent time there every summer, um, but it wasn't a world I was directly involved in. So we sort of enacted it ourselves. We did a lot of playing pioneers, as we called it. Um, and so, you know, in my adult life, I've spent time thinking about what it means for us to be playing kind of uh, reenacting this, um, this, you know, westward expansion um, and how problematic that is. Um, sort of the, the big reveal is that my family is, my mom is related to Laura Ingalls Wilder. So uh, if you keep hearing the name Ingalls, that's why. Uh, it's pretty distant, but we were 
obsessed with that fact as kids uh, that our relative had written the, the Little House books. Um, so yeah, so this poem is sort of trying to think about um, my family's own part in, in that settler violence in the West. Uh, and also how our, I guess, how our family heroes sort of get venerated and how those stories get handed down and handed down, um, how they become so mythic in a way. The poem's called Make Believe. We were what anyone would call obsessed, reenacting that colonial crossing the family always deemed heroic. Yes, Ingalls is my mother's maiden name. A radio flyer, our covered wagon. If we were nice, we might convince my brother to pull us in it westward through the yard. <laughs> As Pa, he had a wooden gun for shooting game. I, always Laura, she was wildest. My sister, baby Carrie, I could boss her. I hated beef jerky but it seemed authentic. So did our fringed vests. We stole carrots from the garden and ate them with the dirt still crunching in our teeth. A blue tarp for the rivers we forded, all this caught on film. As a teen, I exchanged my gingham bonnet for dying of dysentery in a game I played white knuckled. Just like those books, this tells you what I did. <laughs> Maybe you caught the uh, Oregon Trail computer game <laughs> reference in there and Gabe's laughing. <laughs> um, okay, there are some poems in here that are that are sort of less um, less narrative, so I'll, I'll uh, read a couple of those. This is I recuse my set piece. We are in the soft, warm center of summer. You come closer and say, oh, it's colors. They get on the wind like a scent. Oriole or red wing, you hardly knew. My reaction's admirable too. Watch me in the blind, I'm showing off mine. Every single one keep shining side by each, so we have them to hand. 20 sightings says, the life I've got I want, or we're much put upon by sky. Under it, I saw blight on all things, all useless in the waver, a small tree standing in a shorn field, shorn forest. It was a birch. What else to say beyond what you? In a string of slow names, I found yours to make a tongue turn thunder. Joint trunked, balled up, best bunched. I know we use what we need now. Time to set this set piece down. Okay, and last one from, uh, from the chapbook, I'll read Rare Earth. I have a sliver of qualm. That's in 3D, you know, meaning you can see it all over me, that river smell, murky on me, like you on that rock above seeing me or from a limestone cliff could be. The sliver is, you're there, is not sure where to put your foot. In the night, in the hotel, on me, in the rock's spine, on mine. Okay, 17 minutes. <laughs> um, I'll read you some, I'll read you some short poems. Um, uh, that I translated from Spanish there by Carlo Acevedo, who's a Colombian poet uh, and, a, and a good friend of mine. He was studying in the Spanish creative writing program at Iowa when I was in the writer's workshop. And so I've been translating him for quite a few years now. 
he writes these very condensed, short poems. The longer he works at them, the more, like, the shorter and tighter they get. Um, so they're really fun to translate because you've only got a few words to work with per line, really. Um, and I'll, I'll read, maybe I'll read one of his in Spanish first, uh, just to have, to have the original in the room. They're, they're untitled. This is the first one. Simplemente sentarse. El canto del grillo es el canto del grillo cuando la luz del día y las ramas de los árboles se reúnen en dos convicciones, quietud y silencio. <coughs> Do nothing but sit. The cricket song is the cricket song when daylight and tree branches meet in two certainties, stillness and silence. Truth and fire, thesis and antithesis, facing off in the brevity of a phrase. No truth can resist a trial by fire. Fire shows not the least pity for truth. You might kind of hear some echoes of, um, of Carlos' Buddhist, Buddhist practice in here. He also, um, he does write uh, haiku and he, he, he's very careful with the syllable with syllable counts. In my translation, I was, I was a little more free, a little more of the Jack Kerouac uh, haiku pers persuas persuasion. Um, the itch as fingertips brush summer grasses, the woody smell of rainy mornings, the burning in the belly during hungry hours, the lips of the daughter that kiss my forehead, like dew on blades of grass, everything will come to an end. At the vague edge of the beach where the shore is drawn and redrawn, the dry dusky shag of dead seaweed accumulates, embracing like a nest, a solitary coconut rocking with the stammering of the waves. Of the awe stirred up by the pigeon's aerial racket, only the blue of the sky remains. Okay, what do you think? Do you wanna hear some very short, newer, newer poems? I feel like it is, your, it is your right as an audience to hear some new, some new shit, so. Here's a few very short prose poems um, written kind of at the, at the early part of the pandemic or thinking about the early part of the pandemic. You'll hear some echoes of that time in here, I think. Um, and then also there's a lot of quotes in here, a lot of quoted material, which I sometimes mark and sometimes don't really, don't really mark where the quotes are. Um, and then uh, they're also sort of thinking about my... Um, I was raised in the evangelical church, the non-denominational church. So they're sort of thinking about like my own, um, what was handed down to me in terms of my own um, faith background. They're very short. This is hero image. Oh, we might get the train. Okay. They're short. You're they're short. <laughs> we'll see how far I get. Sometimes I, oh, they might be funny. So if you think they're funny, you can laugh. I think that, I think they're a little bit funny. We'll see. All right. It's just cause I. Thank you. 
like we just got for blessed by the blessed by the train. Okay, am I safe now? You never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> try. Okay, I'll try. Hero image. Sometimes I call the cat little bit. I'm scared how easy she could die. I can fit my hand around her head and I know what a cat's skull looks like. Sometimes my tattoo aches a little on its mark. Sometimes I override it. Disruption's just another word for nothing left to lose. Dashboard. Workshop looked like worship, a mistake I've made before. In fact, the evaluative impulse is so strong that my project is a continuation of last year. Is that your church sweater? Asked a writer of my ivory cardigan at the bar. A page will not sit down, said Susan Howe to her webcam in her office. My best posture is when I'm on the move. I need to make eye contact with both people and one of them is me. What I want to be is handy. Leaderboard. My neighbor practices his Spanish every day reading Allende aloud to himself on his porch on warm mornings and listening to the news. He converses with someone on the phone. I listen to him through the wall with a glass to my ear as I learned to do from Harriet the Spy. The conversation topic is bitch about your boss. He's getting better. I forget if we have a curfew tonight. Soft skills. I made a Reddit to solve my car's mysterious alarm. I called the post mysterious focus noise and filled it with the terms to get mechanics on my side. First clear day in a while, so I cleaned her up, said a silver focus owner. Mine's red orange, like it's leaking coolant, except it's thousands from being mine. My priest sees energy streaming from the bread and wine. Input. This is the last one. The landscapers weed whacked the daffodil every time they came until they didn't. Dad was always trying to get us to be more outgoing. 50 cents if we ordered our meal ourselves. The chance to record the answering machine greeting. Here the Baptists were last to give up the ghost and met till so late in March, a guard in Park Ranger Brown had to stand in their lot Sunday mornings. I know because they meet behind my house. I think of the friends who said to go from being friends to lovers, they had to stand in a night field very near for very long. A poem is only true in the moment and not in the next one. My cold sores shouldn't leave a scar, but they almost always do. I've had a little hypochondriac inside, unable to table. I want to be seen as chill, so I say things like, easy peasy, no worries, no hurries. But something's always wrong with my mouth. My brother landing on a carrier at night, darker than you'd imagine, like closing your eyes. Thank you so much for listening. I feel like they know more about South Dakota, ranches, <laughs> Columbia, and any number of things. <laughs> That's good. Fantastic. Um, we're not going to take a break between poets tonight. So if you want to get a water, because I know it is warm in here, anything like that, do it while I'm talking. <laughs> not, not when she comes up. So um, I won't talk very long too, so you should do it right now. It's such a pleasure to have um, Janet Rodney here. Someone who 
I first met in the 1980s and have done my best to follow her work since in books such as Orphidigy, which if you don't know the name Orphidigy, it's like a junction of Orpheus and Eurydice. And if you know those stories, at least in one version, um, after Orpheus dies, their souls are joined. Uh, but there's a lot of ways you might think of <laughs> this, especially after you read the book. Uh, Moon on an oar blade rowing, and her selected poems titled Terminal Colors. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and read something from the back of the book, and then I'm going to kind of share and at least one insight that I have, which may be totally wrong, but she can let you know. Um, poet, artist, and printer Janet Rodney lives in New Mexico, uh, just northwest of Santa Fe, where she manages Weasel Sleeves Press, which is a letterpress uh, printing um, operation, printing poems in broadside forms and small books. Her childhood was spent in the United States Europe and Taiwan. So she has everything there too. She worked as an interpreter, editor, and translator in Spain for 15 years. She is, and, and she's the author of those books I just mentioned. I wanted to quote something from the end of Orphidici, where she writes, you'd have to leap up and touch the flower at the top of an arch, pure white alabaster texture. Look down and hear the cries of the world. And, and then I was struck with how that rang off of one of the last pieces, or the last piece, I think, in Terminal Colors, her selected poems, when she writes, um, a flower, again, a flame placed just below eye level, where attention is focused over and over, small mirrors invading the body, then move a little further and go a little deeper. And I think that's what she does, moves further, goes deeper, and from the point of view up with the flowers, looks down and hears the cries of the world in a way that make me um, also look farther and deeper. So it's a real pleasure to work with Jen. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, I don't know, maybe one doesn't really need the microphone uh, unless one? the train comes. <laughs> and then maybe I'll grab it and yeah. try and make some noise. Um, so I usually start with um, one uh, poem, and it's just sort of traditionally that way. And it's, um, okay. Now in sleep with you, musk eyes tilt, especially moons behind worn lids. Time worms spiral down. Blue after blue or fittacy after these nights of love. Don't look back on us now as to in sleep, but remember the flower smells of flesh. Rapture of the Deep. We'll probably start with that one. Um, now, uh, a, a poet called Lisa Bourbeau, um, who actually, she's been here. And, and Lisa Bourbeau. Isn't, it, isn't she one of Jackson's? No? Not no, her. I mean, I know who. You know, know who she is. Well, anyway, uh, she. <clears throat> was asked by Ed Foster of Talisman uh, to um, put together uh, 
poems by women, uh, which would be online. And uh, so this is what came out of that. They're, they're short. And uh, the title <clears throat> is This from a Woman Tattooed to a Wall. The Jewel. Dial-tone silver cast in sand just behind an earlobe where bone tunnels inward, desert rose where white lights adder just a while ago entered. From this from a woman tattooed to a wall. And each one has a title. The Jewel, dial tone cast, silver cast in sand, just behind an earlobe, where bone tunnels inward, desert rose, where white lights adder, just a while ago, entered. The Happy View. Looking at a wider field, factors of existence emerge as swift realities. Rising, floating, dissolving, waves roll on an ocean bed. Before one ends, another forms. A mode of seeing turns inside a body. Complex events, not bones, not flesh, yet flesh and bones, turning as it turns, miseries into joys. Forever irreverent, the lamb of defiance. The insect song. Think of endless dying, fragile forms blown apart, or fading woman, child, or man. Interactive forces all in time occurring. He or she owns many things, each one subject to destruction. Voices of insects whirring, listening itself, how complicated. We have lives and want to live, legs rubbing in the night. Corner Man. In the courts of an abandoned mind, shattered pieces pierced by silence, shapes and figures emerge, dissolve, reform in filmic fluid. A line loves its progress through time. This man in the street, body trading, syllable with night, talking to himself, talks his body out. This man interweaving curb, bones sharp under skin, says aloud, I need you. Spare a spare rib? Mm -hmm. All this time so lonely, he asks himself what for. People pushing past him on the street's sharp edge. What kind of burial is this? <clears throat> Eventide. A room in silence, seedless. Reflections on the window, suffering and its origins. Sky the color of mother flesh. She gets onto a bus, destination anywhere. A few decades or minutes ago, a woman is breaking that silence. I don't know how she does it, but night is falling in a condiment of words. Carnography. Yesterday, Egypt is rising to an Arizona surface. For a woman already tomorrow, a falling dot is a bomb. Her body discovered in sand, undulating lines in dunes. An old navigation chart, bent sticks indicate wave formations. Shells are islands where a mind can be quiet. Trackless winds of survival. Catacomb. A weightless window, floating cube, compression elysium, View, low light winters, headlights move through suns on glass. 
What encloses a mother in such a room, her children around her? Halls of skulls, mouths wide in faces, a table feel it feeding daily, eyes, sockets, sleep. That human vision, fugit her. He who loves knowledge, go gently along the lines of doubt. Hollowed halls belong to no one in this realm. Oxygen, viral, bacterial beginnings keep moving and out of nowhere, listen. It's the same old, same old difference. Truth to tell, be teller of truth. It's quiet tonight, I'm all ears. Soledades. Solitudes fly out of trees, arrowed beaks and bright plumes, circular descent through air. One body so small comes to rest. Someone says she might be dead. See what's down there, sky above receding, inside the compass flower, a woman lies on fire in flaming vermilion wings. The blues. A hook catches my heart again. Blue blood back to red. The blues are running again. Blues with silver scales. Lyric symbols, broken tales. Blue voice in my veins. Music running blue there. Salt from their fins. Rivering the air. Depression. Um, Carolee Campbell did a beautiful broadside of this. Depression. The air so thick with wind and dust, no room. A body has no room to move, walking wind so thick. A homeless victory, gravity so thin. Branches tossing in the window. There is no, this is no sane world we live in about to end as it is, the body so far from joy out there. Today the new, sounds like talking cliffs, edge of a river, dry this time of year. Only a smell of water lies cool in weight of air on the bed of canyons where camouflaged by undergrowth Insects laden with pollen hover harmonic beginning. The window pane. A red ant stings this paralyzing thought. Gravity's continued contraction is morphing into freefall. Between the drops from outer space of gentle rain that may at times pass through matter an ultraviolet hawk, instead of striking, flies through glass. That's, that's that series. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see, I think I'll, you know, keep this quite short, but let's see. Um, how am I doing on time? Just out of curiosity. I don't know. Plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll do a little cue from here. Um, I wanted also just to bring up uh, First Intensity was um, run for many years by um, Lee uh, What's her last name? See, this is my 81 years. <laughs> um, Lee Chapman. And she really did it on a dime. And um, I was concerned about her because I'd heard that she had um, diabetes. And I, I wrote to uh, Judith Reutemann, who um, was 
doing a GoFundMe for her. And I said, I, I saw this ages ago, how is Lee? And she said, well, I am so sad to tell you that Lee died of COVID on Thanksgiving Day, 2020. And it, it just seemed to me that that's, that's what the way Lee would do things <laughs> in, her, in her inimitable way. She just was so kind and helpful to people, young, young poets who didn't really have uh, a lot of exposure and so on. So the, the title of this is Moon on an Orblade Rowing. And the, this image came out way too purple, <laughs> but it's an, it, it's an image of an upside down Eskimo skin boat uh, up in the Arctic. So I'll um, just read a couple of these crystals here. The time of which I write is a memory of getting back to Mother Earth, mouth pressed to hers, desires irresist irresistible curl of lips. When love for Father Water is strongest, I look for his eye and hear demonic laughter as from outside, up from the ocean. All of these crystals are numbered, so I won't repeat the number. Long after all horizons have proved themselves mortal, I see my rider shadow galloping along the beach. It is August. Lead-bellied gulls rise toward the rock, Jebel Tariq, where Atlantic currents and Mediterranean mix, wild roses corrupting on its face. You are right. At this time, the mind is a mirror to the sun, the heart a coal, bright in the wind. Nothing is mine but the ride before the sequence vanishes like lead, drawn down through deep water. <clears throat> At center, the heart, round and round, pumps its love from right side to left, blood flowing through lung, artery, and capillary, to distant cells where at every moment a mind possesses itself at levels of oxygen, acids, fats, and salts, pours into, de into a definition atomic in its meaning that love is an unbroken cycle, performs many chores on its round. Is, is this working? Okay. <laughs> this one is just because I, I love this uh, painting. I used to work in a news agency not too far from the Prado, so I could go there at lunchtime. And, uh, anyway, this is um, the picture of Las Meninas, of Velázquez, and so it is the man behind the ladies in waiting. In a mirror disclosing the simple locus of a glance, an ambiguous visitor moves back or forth, halfway through the door, always in the foreground. I, Diego Velasquez, hold my brush like a spire. Birds could fly around. We never speak, but my oils color your flesh and reproduce you without violence. Now, some of these are, I don't want to go too far here. Um, some of these are in, in, written in places where we were living. Um, and this one was written in Guatemala, under the weight of seasons. A land and its people who know this arrival is their undoing and allow it to happen. Give themselves over to a beginning of destruction in their joy is great pain, in pain, the knowing. Rain undoing, silvering down, slipping without shadow. A funeral winds uphill, wife's wail, drowned in violin. Men reel under the box, bare toes grip the path. Cat comes in, rubs the door. Dami, 
dame de comer, vida mía. <clears throat> And this one actually um, made it onto the buses of New York. <laughs> uh, Remember the earth is a body, And if you're very still, you can put your hand on the mountain's rib and feel it breathing. City of the Long Spring, Manchuria. Uh, we, we got there for a summer as part of an exchange. Uh, and they speak the most beautiful Mandarin there. It's the clearest bells ringing, and it's just incredible. Um, however, it was where the Japanese uh, wanted to set up their Wanchukuo. So anyway, this is just being there. To be born could be just waking up somewhere new, a northern plains first light, unknown and moving under trees people ringing syllables through silence of space, tones of another life. See, the eye is fresh. And this is, the title of this is, A Short Yang Form, which you will probably recognize as Tai Chi. But she would like to seize bird's tail and shifts weight to left foot, allows right heel to rise, turns left palm downwards, right hand gliding up to rest at abdomen. Holding a ball of time, circle for a bird to fly in, live there for a while should he wish, and also fly out. There must be, she thinks, such freedom in a heart where birds can fly around. Okay, I'm going to move to um, terminal colors, which uh, some people were saying, you know, is this what's terminal about this? Is this? Uh, <laughs> but my thought was that um, it is terminal. It's not just a terminal. And uh, so I'm, I'm just going to read a few things here. Um, let's see. This is from a poem called um, Echoes from the Spanish Civil War. Uh, no, wait a minute here. Let me just see. Okay. It's quite a long sequence, but I wanted to get this one on. It was it was dedic I dedicated it to a friend of mine, um, Faustino González Aller. Uh, he was, a, you know, worked for the UN and he was a novelist and so on. And his son has I've known him since he was four, and we, we, we still in touch. But he told me this uh, story. In Gijón, there was a sniper named El Paco, because the sound of his shots would buckle through the streets. Imagine the swirling oval of a storm that never moves and never stops the familiar look of turbulence in an otherworldly world, and consider one set of possibilities at a time by looking at a line traced diagonally in the sky to the bar of a cross top atop a spire. Church lamp sways back and forth, sniper in the belfry parleys his shot. Regions of red, blue, or green adjacent in the mind. Before long, the signal disappears and colors multiply, art of the unexpected. Knowledge of the fundamental equations no longer seemed essential, yet she was pleased to discover regularities in the behavior of the enemy. In a moment, momentarily frozen in time, the trajectory of a single bullet comes to represent complexi complexities of an enduring image that is continually vanishing. The process mimics a visual analog of the north-south position of the church. Two points that end up close together may have started off far apart, 
A passerby clutches his chest. He cannot guess where he will end up. There is this echo, echo, echo that will cut him down. That was for Faustino. Um, so now, let's see here. Um, So there's a, uh, a sequence here, which is Bardo's of the Ordinary Life. And I took um, from a quote by Sogel Rinpoche, which says, every moment of our experience is a Bardo, as each thought and each emotion arises out of and dies back into the essence of mind. Um, Bardo of the Threshold. Extraordinary events befell my family. The human species took to the air. Belligerent wings allowed the worms elegance on earth. That was long ago. We became human together, you and I. We were friends to our voices, wisteria in the wind. Often we covered the ground with our wildness. I drew you to me slowly like a child and saw the milk of animals in your eyes. Tonight the air is still, sound of rain when none is falling, ants in low, long chains traveling toward the forbidden. I shelter your sleep where origin stands. Your face is a doorway to the deep. I was a little disconcerted because I left my copy of, <laughs> of the uh, Terminal Colors at home. The Bardo. I'm sorry? Are we in the Bardo right now? Yeah. <laughs> this is <laughs> where we live. Sorry. In it. Um, well, no, I think I. Well, wait a minute. Here's something that's. Okay. There was a ship, and through it the fog came. Watermelon flat on white. A knife to cut, regardless of the night. The body remembers in symptoms, hours, and ours, as never then upon the air. Follow the road out beyond the compound. Go on down the arteries of memory again and again. He breaks into view terraces of Spanish garden, persimmon mountains. You who only want to see what lies in front of you might mean you are afraid. Still life with shadows. A mother born in Fort Sam Antonio, Texas, shadow of the Alamo. We are flying across the ocean flat below, world above the waves, an underlying spiral attitude, spiral attitude determines proportion, even as the road turns inward. This might mean his body movements grow slow and thick when seen from above. Through that liquor of light runs an old darkness dimension of being not quite solid, depth of field across the ocean, the meaning of form, a form beyond its meaning, bearing down, his, the man's heart, swollen, still, life, 
with shadows, with and moving forms, knife to cut what is only a dream until now. Thank you. Now. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry about the uh, uh, difficulty with the, uh, you know, hearing me. So you sound you sound oh, great. That was okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We're not going to have a formal question and answer time tonight, but um, we do invite you to. Please have some more water, drink, food, and go ahead and ask, mingle and ask the poets questions if you wish. And uh, I hope we might see some or most of you in two nights at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, 545 South 5th Avenue um, for a reading by Nathaniel Tarn, who is here tonight. Nathaniel Tarn has literally dozens of books and including the very recent um, kind of autobiography, which he titles Atlantis and Auto Anthropology. And so if you're interested in that, um, love to see you there. Thank you for coming tonight.